Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. We ask that you would not only bless as we have heard it read in our ears, but that you would bless the imprinting of it on our hearts. Would you be pleased to be glorified in our midst, that we would trust you and be sure of what you have done for your people in Christ Jesus. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We began this series of Luke reminding ourselves that the faith that we hold in Jesus Christ is a reasonable faith. It's not just something that we have made up. It's not something that we have to look past in order to believe. It's something that if you look at and take time to dig through the facts of the matter, you will have faith in Christ. That's what Luke's desire is, to give a reasonable faith and present the research and the experience that he has to bear to tell most excellent Theophilus and anyone else who would listen the true faith of Jesus Christ and how reasonable it is. I say that to remind us we are doing that even now this morning. Even as we hear the results of the promise that God made to Zechariah way back uh, in the beginning of this chapter uh, while Zechariah was serving in the temple. Even as that promise is now going to be made manifest in our presence this morning, metaphorically on the pages of Scripture, that we need to know this is part of that reasonable faith. These actions that what God has done point us to the true foundation that we plant our faith in Christ in. And so you would say, if God were going to do something great, he wouldn't just kind of start at one point in time and just kind of appear out of nowhere. He would be doing other things behind the scenes. He would be setting the stage. He would be orchestrating all of the details in order to present exactly at the right time what he's going to present in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we see this morning. You see, John the Baptist is the one who is preparing the way for the Lord. John the Baptist is like one crying out in the wilderness, repent of your sin. And we'll get into that as we move forward through the Gospel of Luke. But this morning, what the Holy Spirit has given us is the pre-stages of even that ministry of John the Baptist preparing the way for the Lord. And we see the fingerprints of God at work. As we work through this passage this morning, what we need to see is the responses of those that are given eyes to see, the responses of those that encounter what God is doing in the birth of John the Baptist. And so we have Elizabeth, and we have Zechariah, and we have the neighbors and relatives that are present in our account this morning. But we need to pay special attention about what God does 
and what comes of what God does, the results of what God accomplishes. And so first, what we need to see is that God's mercy brings joy. God's mercy brings joy. Now, you have to have eyes to see it. That's exactly what Elizabeth has. This is the day. Uh, Except for some circumstances, perhaps becoming more common these days than it was, uh, you do not know the day, if you are a woman that is pregnant, you do not know the day when you will give birth. But God does. Elizabeth has finally gotten to that day. That day that she can meet the one who leapt in her womb when Mary came, as we saw previously. That, Mary, that Elizabeth is able to hold in her arms the promise that God had made her husband and for which her husband has been mute since because of his disbelief. Elizabeth is the one who's leading this rejoicing. Elizabeth has eyes to see. Remember with me back in Luke uh, 1.25, at the end of this account that we see as Zechariah goes home, Elizabeth says this, The Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown me his favor and has taken away my disgrace among the people. Elizabeth has eyes to see the mercy of God at work. And she is the one who is leading in this train. She is the one who is leading in this throng. She is the one who is carrying the banner of joy for God's mercy. Look at what God has done for me. But notice the the neighbors are are in this as well. They are encouraged. Uh, They are wondrously seeing what uh, what has happened to Elizabeth. They're giving testimony to that mercy. They are coming and they are showing, uh, as Luke records for us, they share in exactly the same sentiment of what Elizabeth has. The Lord has shown her great mercy. And that produces joy. Mary has eyes to see truly what's going on. But the neighbors and the relatives are giving testimony to this mercy. Now, if you do the math in this, we have Elizabeth, who when she is six months pregnant with John, Gabriel appears to Mary. And Mary goes to Elizabeth in her sixth month. And Luke records for us that Mary, in verse 56, right before the the verse previous to what we read this morning, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months, then returned home. Luke does not record for us Mary's presence at the birth of John the Baptist. But can you imagine Mary going home right before the birth? Can you imagine? Well, it's about your time, Mary. I, I probably should be going now. What is God doing? God has appeared to Mary through Gabriel, proclaimed to her what he is doing and the the child who she will bear. And as we looked at last time, Mary is going and she is seeing the confirmation of what Gabriel had said. But Mary is staying through, I believe, Mary is staying through to bless Elizabeth and be blessed with the birth of John the Baptist. At any rate, even if Mary isn't there, we are told that Elizabeth is surrounded by neighbors and relatives who know, Mary, who know Elizabeth's story, who know that she was barren, that she was beyond childbearing age. And so they recognize this mercy You can imagine that some of the the neighbors, especially in in the final days of of pregnancy, I don't believe it was 
it was, uh, it was miraculous that she became pregnant. I don't believe it was miraculous as far as carrying the child. She experienced the same things that any other pregnant woman experienced. She was ready to have that child at the end, just like any other woman is ready to have that child at the end. And consider for a moment the support that she's getting from the community around her. Yes, they are excited, they are thrilled that she is having this baby, but you better be believe, believing that they're, she's getting called Sarah. You better be believing that she's being uh, called, where's, you know, where's Zachariah? I mean, Abraham. You know, you in your old age are having this child. The, maybe the, the modern, you know, um, the relevance of it is, you know, do you need the do you need the crib in order to kind of balance? You know, you can have a walker crib uh, kind of combination in your old age. There's a recognition here of the state in which Elizabeth is in. But the greater recognition is what God has done in Elizabeth. Because they recognize that it is mercy. They recognize that it is God at work. They are recognizing that this child, the child who we saw last time, uh, responded, filled with the Holy Spirit, responded to the mother of his Lord, not just Elizabeth responding to the mother of her Lord. There's a recognition that any birth is the mercy of God. This is from the very beginning when Eve gave birth to Abel. This is a recognition of how God is at work. And I would argue it's a recognition that we see in our own culture of a rejection, of the dehumanizing of the child who is in the womb. It's a dehumanizing of of that mercy that God has worked in humanity. That despite our sin, despite our fallenness in the garden, that God continues his work through humanity, through the childbearing of his people, his creation. The command is still the same. Be fruitful and multiply the earth, subdue it. We do it imperfectly. But God doesn't change in his commands. There's a testimony of God's goodness here and his blessing. And so what is the the response? The response for us is the same as the response for those neighbors and those relatives that come alongside of Elizabeth, and that is to rejoice. Rejoice in light of God's mercy. So the call is this. How has God showed you mercy? How has God showed you mercy today, this morning? How has God showed you mercy this last week? Are there points in your life that you can look back and you can say, surely God is merciful. Only only a merciful God would give me this. Only a merciful God would allow me this. Only a merciful God would save me from this. Those are general acts of God's mercy. But there's something even greater that we have uh, in our midst this morning. Specifically, the mercy that we are shown in Christ Jesus. And the rejoicing that comes from the reality of that mercy. Now, we are, we are human, we are frail, beset by sin and kind of our own lethargy, we lose sight of this on a daily basis and we can't see the full glorious reality of this mercy. And that's why we take moments together. That's why we seek moments throughout the day, throughout our weeks. So we take special attention and look at what is the mercy that God has shown me in Christ. Not just, oh yeah, I know that, next. But have you sat and stared, metaphorically, at the truth of the mercy that God has given you in Christ Jesus? Have you woken up and and maybe just sat on the edge of your bed 
and considered before you start your day. In Christ Jesus, God has showed me all mercy. What is that? What have I done to earn that? Nothing. The only thing that I have done is brought my sin to him so that he can redeem me. God has shown me mercy that not just has he forgiven my sin, he has shown me mercy that I can live for him, that I can walk in where he would have me to walk. That is God's mercy at work in you. The good that you do is not from your own strength. It is the power of Christ in and through you doing that good. That's God's mercy. The call is to rejoice because God's mercy brings joy. Secondly, we need to see God's promise um, calls for obedience. God's promise calls for obedience. Given the opportunity we see here, there's uh, plenty of time where both Elizabeth and Zechariah can back out of calling this son John, a, a name that isn't part of their family, a name that doesn't bring glory to their family lineage, a, a name that doesn't give them something uh, of, of ownership, but points something a little bit foreign of what's happening in their own family's midst. But faith believes and acts. This is what we see, the opportunity. The, the neighbors and the, the relatives, they come. And this is a, uh, a phenomenon that we don't necessarily have in our own culture. Um, that on the, uh, on the, on the eighth day uh, and, and the circumcision happening for a firstborn uh, son or any son, that the whole um, uh, village turns out. That's not something that we normally do. But it's John, in, in accordance with the command of the Lord, that on the eighth day he would be circumcised. Elizabeth and Zechariah are obedient. They are following what God has called them to do. They are following along that this sign that God has given the people of Israel for the, the covenant uh, mark of his people, of circumcision, the, covenant and the, 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 the entrance into the covenant community, the mark that he is now in a special place of grace in God's community and marked as his own. Elizabeth and Zechariah are obedient. They act in faith, knowing this is what God has called them to do. But Zechariah, take for a moment, didn't believe Remember? Remember in verse 20 we read this. And behold, this is Gabriel talking to Zechariah. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. And he was silent. And this perhaps is a blessing for pregnant wives. But it is a mark of Zechariah's disbelief. What we see, though, is the result of Zechariah's belief after that. Look with me. The people come to Elizabeth and they say, Well, okay, you're go you're gonna, we're going to uh, circumcise this child now. We're going to call him Zechariah after his father. Certainly the, the, the man in his old age, passing on the family name. This is what everybody should do, right? This is what we're going to do. We're going to name him Zechariah. And Elizabeth, how does Elizabeth understand that his name is John? She wasn't in the temple. She wasn't visited by Gabriel. How does Elizabeth understand? Zechariah communicates to her. Now, we'll see. He can't talk. He, he has to communicate. It takes effort and understanding. And you can imagine, I, I believe that there's some great work. I mean, they have nine months to work through this. But they have some work to do for Mary to understand his name is what? What, do you, what, am I supposed to, what are we supposed to name this child? We can imagine that she is asking the same questions that her neighbors and relatives are asking. There's no John in our family, Zechariah. Why are we naming him John? 
But as Zechariah explains to Mary what has happened, as as she sees the sign uh, physically represented on his own lips of not being able to speak, she believes and she acts in that belief. The opportunity has come, the neighbors come, and they say, we can name him Zechariah, we can name him any other name that's part of the family. And what does Mary say, or Elizabeth say? No. He shall be called John. John, that means God is gracious. And that's what he is. God has shown his grace and his favor and his mercy to his servant Elizabeth. The temptation is not to believe. The temptation is always there to go along with the crowd. Elizabeth, in her, in her joy, in her exuberance of, of having this child, could very easily say, oh, God, it was great what you did for me. I got it from here. Let me, let me take this and run with it. You, you gave me this great blessing. Now let me take over, and I'm going to do even better with it. What does Elizabeth do? She continues to trust and act in faith. What do we see on Zechariah's part? Well, it requires waiting on the Lord. What did Gabriel say to him? You don't believe, so you're going to be mute until these things take place. In verse 13, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. He will be with he will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. Well, that's what God, that's what, what um, uh, Gabriel said was going to happen. I can't talk yet. He's one day old. I can't talk yet. He's seven day old. I can't talk yet. The eighth day, maybe I won't get my speech back, but I'm not going to deny the Lord. I'm going to act in obedience. And so given the opportunity himself, he could say, I'm not going to get my voice back ever. He could be discouraged and say, this is never going to happen. I'm just going to do my own thing. But what does he do? He continues to obey what God has told him. And whether he gets his voice back or not, he makes sure that it's communicated that his name is John. God's people don't always respond in obedience. God's people don't always respond well we have this example. And we do have examples that do respond in obedience. Whatever the promise is. Elijah is told to go out in the wilderness and stay by a a creek for however long God tells him to, to stay there. And he goes. Paul and Silas are thrown in prison in Philippi and they're able to escape by by the chains being broken off and the doors being flung open but they're obedient to God who has put them in this place our obedience to God is greater than anything else that this world can offer and it results in God's will being accomplished through us so the application here is to live While you are waiting on the Lord, fulfilling his promise to you, live in obedience to him. There's a whole whole host of promises we could get into here. All of scripture is telling us the promises of the Lord. But if I can just highlight one this morning. God has promised you that by his work through his son on the cross, his perfect life lived where you could not live, his death on the cross that you and I deserve, and his resurrection from the dead proving his power over death itself. We have a promise of eternity with him. That promise requires obedience in this life, to be sure. And that promise requires us to continue to trust and act in faith but it is a promise nonetheless. It's a promise that we will not see the results of until either the Lord returns 
or we draw a final breath in this life, it's a promise that we must hold on to. To not be discouraged when there are physical ailments, to not be discouraged when we feel like there aren't things happening around us that we want to see happening, but to live. To walk in the Spirit, as Paul tells the church in Galatia. That we should be about the work of our King and live according to that promise. Well, finally what we see, what God's What God does, his presence is awesome. His presence is awesome. When when Zechariah declares that John is his name, Luke records for us, immediately, immediately his voice is returned. He opened, his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed and he began to speak praising God. That's an understatement. This man who was unable to speak for nine months. If you were unable to speak for nine months, what would you do the first time you could speak? Zechariah praises God. Zechariah has seen a revelation of who God is. And he praises God. The people around him, though, look at what they do. The neighbors and the relatives that have come. The neighbors were all filled with awe or fear. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. The response to God's presence is awesome. I have a challenge with the English language. Really, it should be awful. So if you will, you can cross out awesome and put awful, but understand this. Awful in the sense of it is full of awe, but it is terrifying at the same time. I have not been skydiving, but this is the picture that I have of skydiving. Terrified out of your mind, falling through the air, but amazed at what you're experiencing. God's presence is infinitely more awful and awesome than that. This revelation that the people have is the result is fear. Fear of God. Fear of who is this? What is God doing? This is not natural. What is God doing in our midst? Surely the surely God is with him. Because we see not only do they see a revelation, they see that God is at work. They saw that with Elizabeth getting pregnant. But as they draw near and see God at work, they see more and more of how great God's work is. That's where we need to be at. We need to be in awe. We need to be amazed at what God has done for you in Christ. We need to be amazed at what God does. Have you ever talked with someone? Maybe they they chalk it up to coincidence. Maybe they have wisdom enough to understand there are no coincidences. But if you ever talk to someone and you see the events that take place, they could have transpired over years. But all the pieces that had to fit into place to get to this point in time, who can do that but our God? No one. This is God at work. Who is the God who works even in the short time span that we've had here of of nine months? Who is the Who can do this and orchestrate this that this woman who is beyond being able to have children uh, gets pregnant and welcomes in this woman uh, who doesn't have any relations with any man but yet is pregnant and has both have been visited by angels and we have all of this happening. Who can do that but God? And brothers and sisters in Christ, this is just chapter one. This is just the precursor. This is just God getting out the silverware. He hasn't even set the table yet. And this is what Luke is communicating to us. That the Holy Spirit is working through Luke who is, a, who is a, 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 accumulating all of the accounts of what God has done through Christ. And we get to see these early stages. 
and our response is right if we are blown away by it. Our response is right that we would live in it. Our response is right that we would take great joy in what God and only He can do. In this world, we're going to have trouble. There's no bones about it. We are going to understand and take heart that God has actually overcome the world, that Jesus himself has overcome the world, then we do well to know the facts of the case and know at every step of the way God has been in control and he will continue to be in control in every situation, in every aspect, in every concern, in every worry, in every unknown, God remains good and God remains God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word and ask that you would work in us this response that we see on the pages of Scripture by your Spirit at work, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.